Hey, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Thank you so much for listening if this is your first time listening. And if this is, isn't your first time listening, thank you for continuing to go on this journey with me to talk about all the things that I love about professional wrestling and all the goings on and everything that's happening with us in professional wrestling now. Um, This is going to be a different kind of episode um, than it was, I know, last week. Last week was a little bit emotional because there was a lot of stuff going on with the crises um, that's going on amongst um, our community. But this is going to be a cool show because I'm going to start with your regular news and gossip-ish. And then I'm going to go into an interview with independent wrestling sensation JT Funk. And then I'm going to go into what happened this week in wrestling. So sit back, relax, and listen to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Okay, so welcome to the news and gossip-ish section of this podcast. We're going to start talking about the big news that um, happened this week in terms of what's going on behind the scenes in WWE. Bruce Pritchard, who was in charge of the uh, SmackDown creative, is now going to be in charge of Raw and SmackDown um, now as Paul Heyman is stepping down in terms of creative over Raw. And Paul said he was basically going to focus on his... um, in-ring talent and basically just you know be his regular managerial self in terms of you know Brock Lesnar and all that other stuff and I don't necessarily have any critiques in terms of how Bruce Pritchard has ran Smackdown or has ran a show in the past but I do know there was a lot of rumblings on Twitter amongst um, wrestling fans who felt kind of discontented with the idea that Bruce Pritchard is going to be taking over both shows because they felt like the quality might fall down um but I can't say yay or nay on whether or not Bruce is going to do a terrible job Um, Because I know there were also other fans who said that they felt like, you know, they felt like the women's division was going to take a little bit of a slight um, because of it. But I can't really say yay or nay on him. So we'll just wish him the best going forward. And we also wish Paul Heyman the best going forward because he is one of the greatest of all time in terms of being a manager and also working behind the scenes. He's been working in wrestling for a number of years, Um, not just as a manager, but as different, different um different positions like i'm pretty sure at some point he was a referee he was an announcer of course he was the creator of ecw so i'm pretty sure you know in some aspects he'll still be able to you know bend ears and all that other stuff so i wish both of them the best in what's going to happen also in the news we have gender mahal who is basically out injured now but there was a rumor basically saying that he was supposed to be set to feud with drew mcintyre but of course you know he got injured so last week i had um mentioned that gender mahal was supposed to be basically came back on television a couple weeks ago um and he beat up akira tozawa but then you know you didn't see him on television anymore and that was because he had a knee injury that turned out to be worse than what he actually was and he actually posted on instagram that he was here in birmingham at st vincent's hospital which is where i was born um (laughs) to get his surgery Well, according to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, um, WWE had been planning for Jinder Mahal to feud with Drew McIntyre because of their history as former tag team partners in 3MB, which was a three-man band. Um, That was the group that he was in with Heath Slater and Drew before, of course, Drew left the company and then came back. And... Dave Meltzer also said that it wouldn't have been a long term program and they did it because there was there was a little bit of a lack of top heels in WWE, especially on Monday Night Raw. But now Drew McIntyre is basically set to defend his WWE championship against Bobby Lashley at Backlash this Sunday. So please watch it. And. It's kind of cool to see how Bobby Lashley is being built as a heel as opposed to just some romantic freak with Lana. (laughs) Um, And he's partnered up with MVP now. And MVP seems like he's trying to turn him into this incredibly serious competitor. So, hey, I mean, who knows? No one knows how long Jinder Mahal is going to be out, but we wish him the best and a speedy recovery. But 
here's hoping that Bobby Lashley and um, Drew McIntyre will have a excellent match on tomorrow. Also, amongst all the rumors that's going on, there's a rumor that Charlotte Flair is in line for a bigger push. Now, as you know, ever since um, Becky Lynch left because she's having a baby with Seth Rollins and stuff, they've been sort of looking for a way to bring more eyes to tele to television because they say that raw has been sort of suffering in ratings or whatever so as you know charlotte was the nxt women's champion for a time and after well basically after wrestlemania she was the nxt women's champion and she was on all three brands now it's being reported also by dave Meltzer that after the oscar and nia jacks um match this sunday at backlash charlotte flair will be hope will probably getting another ch a chance at the raw women's championship now mind you a lot of people find that charlotte being in the forefront can get exhausting at times because ever since she's been bumped up to the main roster she's had title after title after title she was the last divas champion that we ever had and of course she was the very first um women's champion with the title that they have now which is now the raw women's title and she's been a champion 12 times now now mind you that's great for a woman but also at the same time it's easy to become it's easy for charlotte flair being at the forefront to become long in the tooth because there are so many other women who could use a bump up like that like they could have built anyone like Shayna baszler up because she we haven't truly seen her since after wrestlemania they could have used this opportunity to continue to build oscar up as a credible champion simply because of the fact that she was undefeated and charlotte flair wound up breaking that record and she hadn't truly full-on recovered now mind you she was a women's tag champion with Kyrie sane for a long period of time but as a singles star they really didn't give her that much to chew on and now it seems like they're only doing they're only setting oscar up for the same type of treatment and that's not really fair and then you also have stars like Liv Morgan or Ruby Riot, or definitely Bianca Belair, whom we haven't seen on television since she was last wrestling with the Street Profits. And there are just so many other women they could be building up. But of course, since WWE is the type of company that likes to have an anchor, you know, in their divisions, Charlotte Flair is a great anchor in the idea that she's dependable and she's just one of the best and it's almost kind of like that situation at survivor series a couple years ago as you know when becky lynch got her nose broken and she couldn't fight in a match against ronda rousey she chose charlotte flair to take her place and she's good she's a good man in a storm that way and that's something that i do respect about charlotte flair and it's not her fault entirely it's basically um booking but at the same time i mean if Charlotte is going to go for another title, the least we could do is try to build up the other women. That's all I'm saying. So there's that. And also in the news, we have Mandy Rose talking about who her dream WrestleMania opponent is. Um, she talked with comicbookmovie.com to discuss being compared to um, Trish Stratus. And she also talked about how Trish Stratus is also her um, dream opponent. And she also, she basically said that when it comes to her being compared to Trish Stratus, it's because they have a similar background. They both started as fitness models and they went through sort of the same tribulations at, in a sense, because a lot of people have this notion that if you start off as just a model, um, then you won't necessarily be taken seriously as a wrestler. But they were both kind of athletes in that aspect because they've done other things outside of just being models in terms of weightlifting and stuff like that. So they were able to adapt to wrestling very well. As you can see, Mandy Rose is a pretty good performer in the least bit like so she's really great and she said that she would love to face Trish Stratus at Wrestlemania because she's been a huge inspiration for her and they've had similar paths in this business and she's always been so nice to her every time she saw her and she also said that Trish was an amazing woman who's created so many amazing moments in her career and she was able to really prove to people that she had what it took now I'm not gonna lie though seeing Trish fight Mandy Rose would be really cool, but 
I just want to see Trish fight Sasha first. Like, if she's going to fight someone, really fight the GOAT. Um, and that's no shade at Mandy Rose, because she's great in her own right. But Sasha Banks, to me, is the absolute greatest of all time in terms of the women's division. Up and down, she has the charisma, she has the look, she has the wrestling ability to go for miles at a time. So I'm going to need for her to actually go up against Trish this time. So, hey, who knows what's going to happen? Um, and also, lastly in the news, Nia Jax basically confessed that she um, mentioned that Ronda Rousey was a person who hurt Alexa Bliss and how she felt the need to stand up to her. So she confirmed Friday that her previous comments about somebody hurting Alexa Bliss on numerous occasions was directed towards Ronda Rousey in an interview with Alex McCarthy of Talk Sport. Um, she said she stepped up and spoke out when Bliss kept getting injured in her matches against the former UFC bantamweight champion and Raw Women's champion. She said, quote, yes, it was Ronda. I do not think she took liberties. I think things happened. And Alexa is very strong. She's so strong willed and she doesn't want to give up. She never wants to be told she can't do something. So for me personally, being such a close friend and seeing that she was trying to fight through this, I felt the need to stand up for her because she wasn't going to do it herself. In her mind, she thought she was doing something right, but I knew it wasn't going to help her in the long run. We do have a really strong bond, and on the flip side, working with Rhonda, I always enjoyed working with her. So it's not like Naya was really being negative. She was just mentioning that it just so happened that Alexa was getting injured in her matches against Rhonda Rousey. Um, and she said that she had to go to the higher ups and had to put down a certain foot and say, listen, Lexi is five foot nothing, 100 pounds, getting thrown around like a rag doll and injured. And she was like, put me in. I'm six foot, 300 pounds. I can handle it. I understand there's a certain thing of being quiet and taking it and be like, no, I want to be a team player. And there's another side where it's like, dude, I can't allow to sit to see one of my good friends who I want to be here in five years so I can continue to work with her like getting hurt. Now, around this time, um, this is in 2018, when Nia Jax and Alexa Bliss were feuding with Ronda Rousey for the Raw Women's Championship. And this was around the time that Alexa Bliss cashed in her, um, her Money in the Bank contract on Nia Jax to win the title. But then Ronda Rousey beat Alexa Bliss um, for the title at SummerSlam 2018 to win her first championship. Now, of course, Bliss has um, been back on television um, since the concussions that she sustained um at 2018's hell in a cell pay-per-view um now as a tag team with nikki cross and they actually just lost the women's tag team titles to bailey and sasha banks aka boss and hug even though bailey's not hugging anymore um <laughs> and nia Jax is now facing oscar for the raw women's championship at backlash this coming sunday and Ronda Rousey has not been on television or WWE programming since she lost her Raw Women's title and the SmackDown Women's title to Becky Lynch last year at WrestleMania. So who knows what's going to happen in that future. But I, for one, look forward to all the action that's going on with the women this weekend because, of course, Bayley and Sasha Banks also have to face the Iconics and Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross for the women's tag team titles in a triple threat Sunday and it's going to be good. So there's your news and gossipish. And now we're going to switch our attention to this interview with the one and only independent wrestling sensation and former champion across the indie scene, JT Funk. All right, so now we've reached a point in the podcast where I'm going to talk a little bit about JT Funk. Um, he is an independent wrestling sensation that's making his way. Um, he is a former two-time Rampage Open Challenge champion and a first state champion wrestling world heavyweight champion. He's wrestled in several different promotions throughout, and he was just an all-around great guy to talk to. He's wrestled in 13 different states. And he's finding his way, as all indie wrestler, wrestlers are during this um, point in time where there's a lot up in the air. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy this amazing conversation that I had with JT Funk. Hi. 
All right. Well, JT Funk. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you for um, coming on to my show and interviewing with me. Absolutely. Listen, I love doing stuff like this. It's amazing. And it gets the viewers to kind of get to know who I am outside of the character JT Funk. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Like, I enjoy um, interviewing with people like you as well because I get to see and get to have an inside look of what wrestling is like um, from people who know it best. So I'm going to start with this one question. When did you fall in love with wrestling? Um, I can remember as little as, I want to say between six or seven. Um, I was, you know, scrolling through TV and I saw The Rock on my TV and I was like, oh man, this guy's amazing. You know, I didn't even see him wrestle yet. I just saw him talking and he had on like, you know, this expensive t-shirt on or dress shirt on and uh, dress pants and he was on the top room just talking. I was just like, wow, that's really cool. Um, I related to him obviously because he was black like me, but he, mm-hmm. was, he was wearing expensive clothes kind of thing and he was not only was he educated, he was handsome looking, um, and he was entertaining. And I was laughing, and I was like, "Wow, this is really cool!" Like, you know what I mean? Um, and that's kind of how it started for me. And um, I just remember, you know, telling my grandmother, "Just hey, this comes on um, every Monday at nine o'clock, so please remind me so I can come in and watch it," kind of thing. And then, um, you know, the rest was history, I guess. <laughs> You know, that's funny because The Rock is like my favorite wrestler of all, like of that era. He's definitely my favorite. He just, to me, he was just the total package. He had the charisma. He had the style. He had the athleticism. And of course, he had the family background. Mm -hmm. So he's definitely one of my favorites. And I'm glad to hear that he's actually, you know, was a, a great source of inspiration for you. Yeah. And another thing, he was easily relatable to everybody. Like everybody loved The Rock, even still to this day everybody loves the rock you know what i mean yes okay so what exactly made you pursue wrestling as a career um well i think i've always i've always um wanted to become a professional wrestler but um i i think it became more reality to me to make it a career was um, when I dropped out of college, that's when it really hit. Like, I want to pursue this seriously. I really want to do it. Um, I can remember as far as the MySpace days, I'm contacting schools in California and all these mm-hmm. different states. Like, hey, I want to train to be a professional wrestler kind of thing. And they always was like, well, you're not old enough. Um, well, it's kind of different now because there's wrestling schools everywhere. But, you know, when I was coming up, when I was about 14 to 15, it wasn't as many um, wrestling schools. But, um, yeah, like I said, soon as I dropped out of college, I was like, kind of like, dang, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. And, you know, wrestling kind of, you know, came in my mind, but it was like, well, how the heck am I going to do it kind of thing? And then like maybe a year after I dropped out of college, I just remember being at an auto zone, um, looking for a part for my vehicle. And they had a flyer oh, in a local indie show. Now, mind you, when I saw this flyer, I had no idea indie wrestling existed. You know what I mean? I knew mm-hmm. I knew WWE was around. I knew I heard of Ring of Honor. I was the big fan of TNA at one point. But those companies seemed really far fetched, kind of thing. Um, so I didn't know indie wrestling existed. But um, it had a flyer um, on a local event, and I was just like, "Oh, that's cool." And then on the back of it something that was like caught my attention was it was promoting a local training school to train for pro wrestling so i'm like oh my god this i think this is my calling right here so um Mm -hmm. it had a number on here um and i called the number media and was like you know they you know you give people the same spiel that you give everybody like oh my god this is something i always wanted to do kind of thing right and um um, a guy to answer he was a local promoter he, he was like hey listen I'm going to give you the contact number for the trainer because you know I don't train people so he gave me the number for the guy to train me and I called him and he set up a time for me to come out and check it out or whatever and I was there and <laughs> never looked back kind of thing wow what an amazing journey to that um who exactly well, was your trainer during that time in which you were training to become a professional wrestler? My trainer? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, my trainer is his name is Mark Haro. That you can actually look him up on Facebook. But I actually just posted him on my Facebook several days ago about him being my mentor because he's still he's still really uh, he's like a positive role model in my life still to this day. I mean, even outside of wrestling. But um, yeah, so. He, I just remember my first day in there, he just had me just do basic stuff, and he didn't tell me if it was right or wrong. He just wanted me to feel it out and see how my natural body would react to certain things. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, he had me get in there, and I'm like, oh, man, I got this stuff. It's easy. You know what I mean? Because I, I didn't do any sports in high school or middle school. I just was naturally athletic kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I didn't get a lot of things that a lot of my friends got when they did sports, kind of like, you know, you your trainer being hard on you, your coach being hard on you kind of thing. I didn't get none of that, you know. Um, so with him, um, it was different, you know. And from the day I met him, he was, like, really genuine. And, like, he never looked at me as as me being a black kid. He just looked at me as a person. That's what he said. He's like, when you step foot in my ring, you're not, you're not, a, you're not black, you're not white. You're a wrestler, you know, even a female. He tells him that, too. So. It mm-hmm. was just genuine from the first day I met him. He's still um, pretty influential in my life still to this day, even outside of wrestling. That's beautiful. So, um, as someone who's been in the independent scene, um, what is the culture of independent wrestling like in terms of your perspective? And how long exactly have you been in the independent scene now? Um, I've been in the independent scene for about five years now. And um, mm-hmm. I think um, you can look at it one or two ways. Um, the one, the first way is that I think it's like, you know, it's like a brotherhood and everybody look out for each other. And, you know, the more people start seeing you, the more people reach out to you. And, then you know, people start to know you. But um, and then on the other hand, it's kind of like, you know, for me, how, how, what I believe is like you would think people will be willing to help you out but like in the beginning like when i first started on the indies it was really really hard for me like it wasn't a lot of people that was willing you know to help me because i think we live in a a time now where people want to hog the spotlight for themselves and they feel like you may take their spot so they don't really want to help you out you know what i mean so i didn't it was a lot harder for me in the beginning because I was trying to navigate and figure everything out you know what i mean so that's why i tell a lot of Mm -hmm. the younger guys now that you can hit me up Whatever I can do to help you, I'll help you because I didn't really get a lot of that in the beginning, you know? Um, and mm-hmm. even still, like, even still, I reach out to guys about certain opportunities and they don't respond and read your message. And it's just really, you know, um, just people selfish and they, they want it all for themselves. They don't want to help people, up, you know, kind of thing. So it's, it's one or two ways, but, you know, it's, I, I guess it's with any other thing you do in life. It's positives about it and it's negatives about it. So you just have to take it with a grain of salt and just keep moving forward. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that you're actually the type of person who will actually reach back and help others because it seems as if, you know, even as a, as a brotherhood, as you're still growing as a professional wrestler, even if, you know, regardless of what career path you decide to take in wrestling, it's good to always have someone who has your back. But that's also in any, you know, career path. So right. uh, it's, it's good to hear that you're actually the person who will actually reach back and, you know, pull your brother or your sister up so that's great to hear yeah um i want to ask you um has your career sort of taken a turn since the start of the crisis and how have you been able to pivot that if it has um that's a good question uh believe it or not it's been working (laughs) financially it's been helping like it benefit me more than it has me actually wrestling And I'm going to tell you why, because, um, you know, I wasn't selling as much T-shirts as I was when I was wrestling. I was selling them, but I wasn't selling as much. You know, people will buy my stuff because I have a huge following. And I also, the most important thing that I have, I'm able to connect, you know, and and network with these people that support me, you know. So it's more than them just buying my stuff. I'm having conversations with these people. I'm getting to know them. They're getting to know me kind of thing. Um, But... The, the the pandemic whereas in most states the masks were required so i came up with the concept of selling jt funk masks and no other wrestler came up with this idea even still to this day aside from wwe they, they're selling masks but i haven't seen anybody yet wearing <laughs> them so yeah like and people 
people are buying these masks like crazy and not only that they're buying them like crazy it's a necessity people need them so i'm not contacting people like hey would you want a mask people are contacting me and it's like hey i need three or four masks i need my primary care doctor she bought eight of them i was just like wow so for me it's it's doing financially it's been doing like numbers for me you know so i'm very grateful um you know for this but it's unfortunate this pandemic had happened because i can't get out and, and you know see my fans and kind of thing but it, mm-hmm. it worked out well for me i kind of made the best of it kind of thing well it's good that you've been able to sort of use that as a means of sort of providing for yourself because a lot of independent wrestlers have had to resort to selling more of their merchandise like that so it's good to hear that that's a good way in which you're coping with it even though of course, you do miss your fans because I, for one, do miss being able to go to events and stuff like that. But, you know, you have to stay safe no matter what. So I'm glad that you've actually been able to sort of make your way around it. Yes. So I want to ask you if there's ever been a point in which you have dreamed of wrestling for a mainstream promotion like WWE or like AEW or Impact or something like that. Um, now when I first got into this business, I've always said my goal is to be in the WWE. Like, I don't care what happens. My goal is to be into the WWE. Um, as I got more involved with the business and I started to understand the business a lot more and with all these different wrestling promotions, aside from WWE, WWE, AEW, TNA, Impact, um, what they think they're called Impact right now. Um, Mm -hmm. And all these and all these independent promotions that are like kind of mainstream in a way. Um, like I said, when I first got into the business, it was just WWE. Now, now that I understand the business now and I've seen and I see friends that are like making it outside of WWE, for me, my dream would to be to at least uh be able to provide for me and my family with a, a strictly wrestling income. You know, so if I if, if I can get to that level without even making it to WWE, I think I succeeded. So that's I think that's my dream now. Just making a living with pro wrestling. Okay, you know, because I've actually I actually went on YouTube and watched um one of your matches and I can definitely say like you have the edge, you know, to sort of to to make it in any mainstream company because I I actually love your wrestling style. Oh well thank you. Um I, I'm gonna I'm just <laughs> mention this to you. Um I do firmly believe that I'm a very, very talented professional wrestler athlete, however you wanna put it. But I think the reason why I'm able to resonate with so many people and people just like being around me is how I carry myself outside of the ring. You know what I mean? And and, and I say that to a lot of the younger wrestlers because they're like, you know, if, if there's any advice you would give me, what would it be? And I'm like, it's really all in how you carry yourself in and outside of the ring. You know, like when I show up to shows, I have like bow tie on. Like I'm already looking like a superstar. The minute I walk in, there, I'm looking like something. And I talk to people professionally. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm trying to be something that I'm not. This is who I am 100%. That's what I tell people. I'm authentic, um, you know, but, you know, it's just a vibe. You know, when you meet certain people, you're just like, man, I like this person kind of thing. And I think with me, you know, um, like, for example, if a promoter asks me to do something that I'm not 100% comfortable doing or something that I'm, I disagree with, instead of me saying, oh, no, I don't want to do it, I come in with a solution. Well, what about if we... What about we do that, but we change this a little bit? So I'm coming to them not with something that I'm not doing, kind of alternative, like to so we can be on the same page, kind of thing. Great. So. All right. So I have to ask, who is your who are your favorite wrestlers to watch um, as of right now? Uh. Believe it or not, I don't watch as much wrestling as I should. Um, but I like a lot of the smaller guys now because I'm considered a smaller guy. You know, I'm six foot, um, 200 pounds, so I'm small. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. I, I like I like the, the more agile, smaller guys. Um, the, the, the Seth Rollins, the AJ Styles. I'm like, I love Daniel Bryan. I love him because, um, you know, with him being his, his size and his stature, Every time you watch Daniel Bryan, you believe in him. I don't know what it is about Daniel Bryan, but you just believe everything that he does, whether it's a kick, a punch, or whatever he does, is just believable. And you look at him like, man, this guy's small, but he just comes with so much intensity. 
So like I'm a big Daniel. I'm not. I don't want to say I'm a big fan of his, but I, I'm a fan of his style. I love watching Daniel uh, Daniel Bryan. Um, so like I said, a lot of the smaller guys: Daniel Bryan, Seth Rollins, um, Rey Mysterio, um, Dolph Ziggler. I'm a huge Dolph Ziggler fan. Um, you know, like I said, the smaller guys. But yeah, yeah, Andrade, those guys, the workhorses. Okay, are there any women wrestlers that you like to watch as well? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I love Naomi. I'm like, uh, I'm like loving Naomi because she's just have everything that you can imagine to make it as a, a superstar and stuff. Um, Naomi, um, Bailey, I love Bailey. Um, Charlotte Flair. A lot of people say she's overrated, but Charlotte's really good. I, I'm not the biggest Charlotte Flair fan out there, but she's she got it going on. She's she has everything, you know what I'm saying? And for her to be able to perform at a high level, that's not easy to do. Um, so I, I love watching Charlotte wrestle. Um, I definitely like Oscar. I love Oscar too. Um, the mm-hmm. women wrestling is just Becky Lynch, obviously. Um, women wrestling is just oh my god, it's just so amazing. They're sometimes I watch them and they're like more athletic than us. It's like wow, I can't do that. You know, so <laughs> when they put us in that predicament, it's like, oh, uh, we need to step our game up. You know what I mean? But yeah, women wrestling is, is definitely here to stay. Definitely. Yes, it is. And I actually love all those women that you mentioned. And it's funny because speaking of Charlotte Flair, I feel like something that's been happening a lot online here lately is the fact that they feel like Charlotte has become sort of um over pushed because they because she's been on all three brands here lately Uh and it's like they sort of thrust her into these um championship storylines constantly all the Mm -hmm. time and a lot of people really feel like that that is sort of you know making her overrated but as far as i'm concerned she is one of the best um but quite honestly, there's so much more talent that's out there that I feel like should be pushed out there to a certain degree. Because Charlotte's going to always be, you know, out in the open because she's Charlotte Flair. Like, that's just what comes with the territory. And but it's just there's so many other, you know, talented women like the ones that you mentioned outside of Charlotte who deserve just as much. Correct. And and I feel like that's what's sort of happening. Now. It's this groundswell of wrestling fans who are just so... I guess they're they're not really like angry that Charlotte is as good as she is. They just feel like she's put she's placed out there so much so to the point to where it's almost like you can barely see anyone else. Yeah, I yeah, I definitely agree with you. I was a little upset that she won the Royal Rumble this year. I was really, really upset because I thought of uh, I thought somebody else should have gotten it, but you know. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, honestly, I wasn't as upset with her winning the Royal Rumble this year simply because I figured, you know, it was going to happen one day. <laughs> so if it's, if it's going to happen, let it happen now. <laughs> and did I mention Bianca Bel- Belair? I, like, love her. I watched her interview with Xavier Woods on his uh, Up, Up, Down, Down channel on YouTube. And, oh, my God, just her backstory of her not, like, not really ever watching wrestling. And Mark Henry found her and you know, got her recognition with WWE and a referral and kind of took off like that. And she, everybody was jealous of her because she didn't, you know, start on the indies like most wrestlers. And, you know, right. so it was just different, you know, and, you know, she got that passion now. But, you know, it's just just hearing her story was like, wow, you know, she came from she actually came from a background of being athletic and being in all types of sports, you know, doing whatever. But. It was just cool to hear that story. Like, you know, when I heard that story, I was like, wow, I really like Bianca Belair now. Yeah, what's so funny is it's just like I actually have an episode that's somewhat dedicated to her. (laughs) So it's just, you know, watching her grow and watching her, you know, blossom into the star that she is, is like it just makes me more excited for her. Absolutely. Um, So it looks like you have a great crop of wrestlers that you just like to watch and everything. So... I have one more question to ask you. Okay. Do you have any dream opponents? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say it's not realistic, but I mean, obviously The Rock. That's like, you know, he's the guy, I, he's the reason I got into wrestling. Um, two other guys that, uh, that, well, one of them is, um, Obviously, Dolph Ziggler, I would love to wrestle him because he's like 
a big influence on me. Mm -hmm. Um, AJ Styles, another one. I would love to because AJ Styles just proved time and time again he can have a good match with anybody. We've seen that numerous times, different sides and stuff like that. And um, this next pick is someone that a lot of my fans keep telling me and picking for me. So um, I want to give them something that they would want to see. Leo Rush, because a lot of people say, oh my God, you and Leo Rush will kill it kind of thing. And um, yeah, so mm-hmm. Leo Rush, Leo Rush for sure. Because everybody keeps saying, man, I want you to wrestle him. And like, I've gotten that so many times. So if I can get a chance, I don't know if he's into wrestling still, but um, the promoter that I'm wrestling for, he he wanted to book the match too. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, definitely a rush. That seemed more realistic than all the other ones that I mentioned. Just because he's on the Indies now. Well, hey, you never know. You put it out there and you spoke it into the universe. So it could go from... from- your lips to God's ears, as my mom would say. So I love it. Hey. <laughs> so, hey, let's just put it out there. And then if you ever face one of these people, I can say, you know, you heard it here first. So <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, JT, for coming on my show and interviewing me. And um, here's, to, and here's to your career. And I hope that you do nothing but prosper and grow to become the best you can be, okay? Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be on your podcast. I had a good time. And I hope to hear from you soon, of course. And keep doing your thing. And one other thing, if you need me to send people to you to interview them, I can do that as well. Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Hey, so if you're like me, you're probably brand new to making a podcast and probably have no clue where to start and probably don't have the equipment to do so. But let me tell you something. There is an app that will allow you to create your podcast and actually give you the tools that you need to make it. It's called Anchor. It's free to use and you can download it right to your phone or your computer. And Anchor will also help you distribute your podcast so it can be heard on places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listen- listenership and it's every- and has everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So if you're looking to use your voice to speak to something that you are passionate about or something that makes your heart sing, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And you can download Anchor from wherever apps are sold. Right, so now we're at the segment. We're going to talk about what happened this week in wrestling, starting with Monday Night Raw. So, this is the last Raw, the go home Raw before backlash tomorrow. So, the show started with Asuka um, making her entrance for her match versus Charlotte Flair in another non title match. Um, the audience members were literally singing her song, and I've I don't know if I've said it before, but the NXT trainees give me life every now and again (laughs) with their reactions. So that was cool. Um, So as she was coming out, you know, to prepare for that match, um, Charlotte didn't come out. It was actually the women's tag team champions, Sasha Banks and Bayley came out to Oscar's surprise. And Bayley came out talking smack as usual, saying, you guys should be thanking us for gracing you with our star quality. In case you've been living under a rock, we beat Alexa and Nikki. And then Asuka was basically saying, this is my ring. And she was basically begging for a fight in Japanese. And then Bailey said, normally this would be your ring, but we can go anywhere we want to. But then Charlotte interrupted them and came out and said, look at you guys going brand to brand like me. Ladies, please enjoy the attention because the people want to see me and Asuka fight. And then the Iconics actually um, interrupted her. And then they said, the match everyone wants to see is a triple threat match for the Women's Tag Championships on Sunday. Asuka got sick of it and she was basically speaking more Japanese um, angrily. And then Charlotte was like, yeah, what she said, which was kind of funny. And then... Charlotte said, no matter how many titles you try to accessorize, you will always be garbage. And then the brawl, and then there was a fight that ensued afterward. And then Sasha Banks and Bailey had a standoff with the Iconics. And then Charlotte and Asuka beat all of them and they had a standoff, which led to 
a match between Sasha and Bailey versus the Iconics versus Charlotte and Asuka in a tag match. So Sasha and Peyton basically scouted each other's moves in the first beginning part and that spot was actually really amazing to see because a lot of people sort of underestimate Peyton Royce and Billy Kay's ability in the ring due to their fact due to the fact that they act so silly, but they're actually really good. So that was cool. And Billy actually was taking the fight to Bailey, like I said like I said before. And there were chants that were saying the they were chanting, we want Asuka. And Charlotte was chopping Bailey and mimicking Sasha's moves or whatever. Then Asuka tagged in and Charlotte was kicking Sasha really hard. Then Asuka gives, gives all kinds of bulldogs and kicks like a crazy girl. Then the Iconics attacked Asuka and Boston Hug, or formerly Boston Hug. Um, Charlotte suplexed Peyton and then punched Billy in the face. And then Oscar tagged him, and then Charlotte tagged right back in and fussed with Oscar because, of course, they can't get along. And then chopped Billy. But as Charlotte was preparing for her um, moon salt, Oscar tagged in and locked Billy into the Oscar lock for the win. So Billy tapped out. But then after Oscar was celebrating the win, Charlotte attacked Oscar and basically beat her up and then picked up the Raw Women's title, saying, You could never beat me. You never beat me. And I collectively side with the rest of the world because, of course, she has to go for a title again. And it's so funny because when she came out at the beginning of the show, she was saying that I don't need a title to be relevant, but yet you're going for another championship, ma'am. So, also... (laughs) with the women charlotte did a interview with sarah schreiber and she said i didn't lose the nxt women's title and because technically at in, her, in your house she didn't lose the nxt title because she was putting Rhea in the um figure eight when eo hit her um finishing move and hit her moonsault and basically covered Rhea for the one two three because in a triple threat you don't have to lose you you don't the champion doesn't have to be covered in order to lose the title so there was that she said it's also a busy it's always a busy time for a flair and she stated that she elevated the women's division and now i'm main eventing raw then oscar came and interrupted her and danced around with the title and then charlotte was like do you take anything seriously and then oscar said yes i do and then she slapped the crap out of her and i was just like yes um (laughs) and also with the women of course oscar and charlotte flair main event at raw um, like I said earlier, there was like on In Your House and also with Raw, the girls bookended the event, which was great. And as the bell rang, um, a Boston Hug came out. Bailey and Sasha came out to watch the match. Then Charlotte hit Oscar with the clothesline. Then Oscar hit, kicked Charlotte in the back of the neck. Then Charlotte kicked Oscar in the chest and threw her over the commentary table. And then Oscar kept battling back with some kicks. And then Oscar went for a hip attack when Charlotte caught her. And then Oscar reversed it into an octopus hold. And something that I find really interesting lately is how Oscar has been able to reverse a lot of different holds from people and, and reverse it into one of her moves and it just shows her ability as a submission specialist which i love and the iconics was watching from the audience and then charlotte kept stomping her in the back and then kept kneeing it or whatever and then there was this point where i believe nia Jax came out to distract oscar and Charlotte used that and hit, and I believe hit the natural selection to win the match, which irritated me because Oscar looked like she was trying to kick out, but then she didn't kick out in time, and Charlotte wound up winning the match. Henceforth, putting forth the narrative that Oscar can never beat Charlotte, which bores me. But we're not gonna, I'm not gonna go off into that and go off on that tirade like I did earlier in the show. So, yeah, Nia and Oscar are gonna fight this Sunday. And the Iconics came out and beat up the, um, and beat up Boston Hug again. So that's pretty much what was going on with the women on Raw. So then there was a recap of Seth Rollins and company, um, sort of going at and trading barbs with Rey Mysterio and Dominic. Then Seth came out in a suit and unseated Byron Saxon to mess with Rey Mysterio during his other interview. And that disrespect was real because, you know, I'll, y'all know I love Byron Saxon. So anytime he's just thrust away, it's just kind of like, boo. And Rey Mysterio said that his eye was healing, but any but he said that the doctor said that any further infection could be bad for it. And then Seth, um, then he stated that he wasn't going to wait to hit Seth with the 619 and you're going to pay he's and he told Seth you're going to pay and I'm going to kick your a word 
Then Seth said, you had the opportunity to walk away a champion and a hero, but you continue to spread misinformation. I want to give you one more chance. And Seth invited Ray and his son Dominic to Raw next week. And then Ray said, you know, the only reason you're inviting me is because you know I'm injured. And then after Seth kept, you know, talking at him, Alistair jumped out of nowhere and attacked the crap out of Seth at the commentary table. And if you've seen this gif online, you will know how incredibly funny that scene was because all you saw was Seth looking into the camera and talking. And then the next thing you saw was Alistair Black's tattooed back coming straight at him. And it was hilarious. It was about as hilarious as that time Keith Lee pushed Adam Cole over into the audience and turned that into like a very viral moment. So that was cool. Which led to a tag team match with Aleister Black and Umberto Carrillo versus um, Austin Theory and Murphy. And this was a very fast-paced, strike-heavy match, of course, especially with Aleister Black and Umberto Carrillo with their um, backgrounds in lucha and also with kicking and a whole lot of stuff. And then Black and Humberto Carrillo won the match, but Seth came out to raise music with a mask on, and then Murphy and um, Austin Theory attacked them, and then Seth curb stomped Alistair Black like Kirk Franklin, and then Seth picked up Ray's mask, so that beef is going to continue to go on, I'm sure. And then Randy Orton had an interview with Charlie Caruso, and he asked her if Edge is supposed to be the only guest on the Peep Show with um, Christian. And so she said yes, but then Randy insinuated that a second person may show up, which led to the peep show, um, which is a talk show with Christian and Edge. And they gave each other, of course, the bro hug because they've been best friends for over 20 years. And Christian basically told Edge that he feels like he's just running on fumes. But the NXT trainees were chanting, you still got it. And he basically said that he couldn't pull off the greatest wrestling match ever, even in his prime. And he said having, but then edge responded by saying that having the greatest wrestling match is like being told to climb mount everest with no crew and no gear and i thought that was pretty interesting to say um but then christian tried to take it a step further i guess he was trying to inspire edge to sort of get that fire in his eyes or whatever and christian actually brought up edge's mom and it put a rise under him and Edge basically, you know, battled back and was saying, you know, all this stuff. It's like, fine, I'm going to believe in myself. And, rah! and it made me feel some type of way because I don't like it when wrestlers actually bring up people who've passed on as a means of getting a rise or inspiring someone, you know, someone's fire to perform incredibly well. Because I know that Edge's mom meant an absolute lot to him. And his mom, you know, did just pass away a couple years ago. And condolences to him, you know, of having to deal with that. But it's just, I just feel like there's really no place. Like, I feel like there's a way to do it. And sometimes I just feel like, you know, that's really not the way to do it. Because as you can see, it made Edge very emotional. It made him cry. And I'm just like, oh my God, why? But... As Edge and Christian were having that motivational talk, Randy interrupted them on the Titan Tron and said, all I hear is what you think as opposed to what you know. And he basically said he's going to, you know, kick his butt on Sunday. So there's that because they're going to have the greatest wrestling match ever. And I know that's not how the song goes, but it's whatever. This is the greatest show. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, and Bobby Lashley attacked our truth backstage with a full Nelson, which I thought was kind of unnecessary because our truth was just trying to hide, you know, with his 24 seven championship. But, you know, Bobby Lashley has to be a bully. And then they show the decathlon that Street Profits and the Viking Raiders participated in. And it started with a six, a sixteen hundred meter dash. And I believe Montez Ford won that one because I believe if I'm not mistaken, he had a background in track. And they kept going back and forth with so many different, you know, contests like turkey eating, turkey leg eating contests, a dancing contest. Montez Ford dancing to the Shawn Michaels theme song gave me all the life in the world because I swear when that song comes on, I lose my entire stuff and just start dancing like a fool because I love that theme song so much. <laughs> and watching Montez dance, it was just like, yeah somebody else understands me um <laughs> and then angelo actually um shot someone's foot with an arrow and it was just kind of crazy so basically um i believe with these contests they're sort of tied up so who knows what other type of 
hilarity is going to ensue from them next week. So I've been enjoying these um, <laughs> these really creative contests that they've been able to participate in. It sort of harkens, pa- harkens back to the segments that they used to have back in the day when people used to do all kinds of random stuff, like especially with Mr. Perfect and him playing basketball and stuff like that. So it was cool. Then Apollo Crews came out, the U.S. champion, with a new theme song. So that was cool. And he talked about how excited he is to defend his United States championship against whoever wins this triple threat match that's um, happening um, later. And he gets interrupted by Andrade and Angel, of course, with Zelina Vega in tow, looking like Ariana Grande. And they but then they got attacked by Kevin Owens as revenge for their attack last week, which led to the number one contendership match. Um... Like, this match was really good. Zelina Vega, like, her outfit, like, her outfit was just so cool. And it was giving me Dangerous Woman tour vibes from Ariana Grande. And <clears throat> Andrade and Angel were fighting amongst themselves. And then Zelina Vega got caught in a crossfire and got knocked down by Angel. But Angel was always blaming Andrade for it. And it was just kind of sad. Um, and a part of me just wonders if she could just drop them and just be her own star. Like, because it's just like it's just not working anymore um angel kicked ko on the top rope and then kevin owens blocked a superplex and um he hit a swanton to a near fall and then super and then there were all kinds of super kicks from angel on andrade and then andrade hit one on kevin owens and kevin owens hit one on angel and it was just really cool and then andrade proceeded to attack angel and and then they were just chopping each other and then there was a clothesline then they clotheslined each other outside of the ring then kevin owens backflipped over the top rope onto them when and then angel attacked kevin owens with a knee lock after targeting the knee with the kick but then kevin owens stunned angel and goes for the cover but andrade kicked him out of the way and then covered and then covered him for the win so Andrade and Angel are going to be beefing at some point. But now Andrade is going to be facing Apollo at Backlash for the United States Championship. And it's good that he won or whatever. But at the same time, watching him fight with Angel and then sort of watching Zelina get hurt in the crossfires, which is kind of like painful to look at. But then Andrade and Angel were fighting backstage. And then as Zelina popped up, you know, covering her mouth and everything from her being injured. Andrade said, Muneca, are you okay? And then she pointed them to move with a very serious look on her face. So, oof, it's getting kind of tense. Then they had a segment with Kurt Angle, who was talking about, you know, all the elements of a great wrestling match. He said, in a great wrestling match, you bring out the best in them and they bring out the best in you. And he believes that both Randy and Edge can rise to the occasion, but he can't bet against his, his fellow Hall of Famer, Edge. So that's who he's picking to win. And then Drew McIntyre and the Viking Raiders were basically chilling out and chopping it up backstage. And then Drew offered turkey legs after their victory in their match. So that was cool to see. And then MVP's VIP lounge took place and he introduced Bobby Lashley. But then Drew McIntyre interrupted him. And Drew said, I thought we weren't friends anymore. You forgot to say I was WWE champion. And then Lana and Lashley were having it out backstage. But then MVP beefed up Lashley's full Nelson move but then MVP says he knows all about the Claymore kick but then Drew doesn't understand their relationship and says you're probably his Yoda and then you'll teach it and then basically says that he teaches Bobby all the secrets on how to win zero championships which is true because MVP hasn't ever hasn't ever won a major WWE championship in his career so hmm shade um then Bobby came out to distract Drew as MVP tried to sneak him unsuccessfully. And then the Viking Raiders came out to Drew's aid. And then the Street Profits came out and Montez was shaking his bottom jaw in MVP. So Lashley, Lashley and MVP had a match um, versus the Viking Raiders with the Street Profits and Drew watching from the side of the ring. And Lana tried to support Bobby, you know, by not being out there. But then she decides to try to focus on her career and having the year of Lana and states that Bobby Lashley is about to become champion. So that was interesting. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all that happened on Raw. So now we're going to go to NXT. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what happened on NXT. So, this was, in terms of the women, 
they had two matches and one of them actually had men in it so i'm going to discuss them both um, I'm going to start with the mixed tag between the Yimitless ones, Mia Yim, and the NXT North American champion Keith Lee, boyfriend and girlfriend, versus the Garganos, Johnny Gargano, aka Johnny Wrestling, with Candice LeRae. So Keith was actually dancing to Mia Yim's song, and <laughs> it was just kind of funny because there was one point where um, all of them were all fussing at each other verbally or whatever, like like Mia was fussing at Candace and then Johnny was fussing at Keith and of course Johnny was bitter because he lost his um NXT North American title match to Keith and in your house so you know they're still got that beef going on but then Candace got in Keith's face and then he looks bewildered and he picks her up and then the match officially starts because Johnny got mad about it and they brawled until Keith had Johnny and Candace lifted in his arms and as they fall out um, before Mia hit the suicide dive, Keith caught her and she sort of had her, her legs wrapped around him. And I was just like, oh, and then there was even another spot where they did clotheslines together. And I'm just a sucker for couples. OK, <laughs> I am a romantic, so I like seeing stuff like that. It's cute. And then Mia Mia did a soul food kick on Candace, and I just I don't feel like she gets enough credit for how amazing the soul food really is like it's really cool so yeah then Mia Yim you know just kept beating everyone's behind there was a point where she was kicking Johnny's behind and Candace's behind and then Candace decided that she was going to hit that gentrified soul food kick to a near fall and I'm just like you don't get to appropriate that move sit down and then Mia um got knocked down as Keith tried to hit Johnny but then Johnny hit the one final beat to make Keith fall on Candace and then Candace passed out and it was really scary like she really did not come to at all after the end of that match and then he knocked her out and then Keith was trying to you know come to um Candace's aid you know like the nice person that he is but then Johnny rolled him up for the win and he was celebrating outside of the ring with Candace's lifeless you know unconsciousless body and it was just kind of awkward, but yeah. So I guess they're going to keep fighting each other. Boo. And then there was a match between Dakota Kai and Casey Catanzaro. And our American Ninja Warrior girl was actually holding her own up against... Up against Dakota Kai. But y'all know that Dakota Kai always has to, you know, cheat and be, you know, the gross person that she is. Um, she got fired, like, basically, like, Casey Can Canzara got fired up and almost stole the win. But then Raquel, you know, set up the captain of Team Kick to win um, with the go to kick. And I'm just like, uh. But then Kai and Gonzalez were basically beating up Casey Canzara after the match until Caden Carter came out to make the save and for a moment carter seemed as if she was like really knocking down everybody in both the heels but then gonzalez used her strength you know with a single arm power bomb to take advantage of carter and dakota kai i mean carter and casey canzaro and i'm looking forward to the day in which casey canzaro and kaden carter actually come together as a full-on tag team because I would love to see them fight Bailey and Sasha if they do retain those tag titles. So that would be very interesting to watch. So that was cool. Now, amongst the men, you had the Undisputed Era come out and brag. And then you got Adam Cole talk about how he's been 300. He's been champion for 375 days and talking about how the era of Cole, the champion will continue and how nobody believed he would win. Nobody believed that the Velveteen Dream would win, even though he's one of the best, but he's not Adam Cole, baby. Now, and Adam Cole was saying, now that I've beaten him, what's next? And he said, it doesn't matter. Nobody has held the NXT championship like I have, and no one can beat me. And he proceeded to call Dexter Loomis a freak who always gets in their business. And what he did was absolutely despicable. And then Roger Strong was like, yeah, he put us in a trunk and everyone knows I hate being put in trunks, which was funny because I don't think anybody really knew that. And then, um, and then Cole said, I'm going to beat you and send you back to the drawing board where you belong. And that's undisputed. But then during the, during the promo, Roger Strong kept seeing, um, 
he kept seeing Dexter Loomis and he kept freaking him out. He was just like, guys, he's over there. And then he would disappear. He'd be like, guys, he's over there. And then he would disappear. But then as they were, you know, leaving and going back to backstage or whatever, Roderick saw Dexter Loomis staring at them again. And he was like, guys, he's right there. And then he ran away and it was like a cartoon. And it was funny. And backstage roger was kept losing it because he kept seeing him you know whatever but then cole and fish were trying to calm him down but then keith was messing with them so that was there was that part and then damian priest talked about how he was defeated by finn balor at in your house and then he flirted with mckenzie and said she was gorgeous but then he beat up cameron grimes after overhearing him diss him for losing against finn balor so i don't know if that's going to set up a feud or what but i thought that was interesting and then they did a recap of the nxt women's title match um at the main event of in your house with eo celebrating her win with the traditional japanese tradition um of giant streamers and confetti everywhere and it was and it was cool then there was a match with indu share with malcolm bivens coming out against these local talent and i'm not sure what their names were i didn't catch them but basically indu share basically ran through them and won the match so that was fast like it was really quick so and i feel weird because a lot of people feel like michael bivens malcolm bivens <laughs> I keep wanting to call him Michael Bivens from New Edition, y'all. Please forgive me. Malcolm Bivens <laughs> isn't a good manager with them because he just looks, they say that he just looks goofy or whatever, but, you know, just give him a chance. Let him, you know, show himself worthy. And then Cameron Grimes um, was talking about how he couldn't compete due to a broken jaw due to his, you know, scuffle with um, Damian Priest. And he was like, I don't think I can fight. But then William Regal, you know, got word of it. But then the ref found Cameron Grimes talking to two gorgeous NXT trainees. And he sounded okay. And he like he was able to move his mouth. So Regal made him fight after realizing he doesn't have a broken jaw. Then they had a segment with Breezango, you know, going through their career highs and how they became unfocused with the fashion police as a tag team, but they were focused on enter being more entertainment based. But they want to leave that part behind to become a more serious tag team as they, you know, purposely flub Imperium's names. And since they are the number one contenders to the NXT tag team championships, they get to they get to fight Imperium next week. Then they showed a recap of Tommaso Ciampa's match with Karrion Cross, And as Tommaso Ciampa um, lost the match and as he was leaving the performance center, he got asked questions, but he drove away. Then it switched to Rhea Ripley um, getting accosted by Robert Stone, who's losing his mind after getting fired by Chelsea Green. And he tries to get Rhea Ripley to join him because she's had a bad year. And then he calls her a big loser this year. And he said he called himself a bigger loser. And then she says, come with me. And so the camera goes to him. He says, okay, I'll be able to do this for you, that for you, or whatever. And then she punches him in the stomach and threw him in the trash. And that was just really funny. So, I mean, Rhea Ripley don't need no manager. Anyway. <laughs> um, Then after that, we had the match with Finn Balor and Cameron Grimes, which was arguably better than the first one they had up against each other. And ultimately, Finn Balor came out the victor in that match. So that was cool to see. But ultimately, I believe this is setting up the idea that Finn Balor is going after Keith Lee next for the NXT North American Championship. And um, Finn Balor dominated um, Cameron Graves towards the end. He hit a reverse 1916 into a coup de gras for the win. So that's going to be interesting to see. And then El Hijo del Fantasma, the new cruiserweight champion, came out to talk about how he um, to talk about how you know proud he is of winning the title. But then he got interrupted by Drake Maverick, who has a new theme song because he's still employed. Yay! And he talked about how he deserved to win after the debut after um, the debut in the tournament. But then Drake wonders what would have happened if he had a clear mind and wasn't focusing on just keeping his job. And so he knows that he can beat Iho. And so Iho accepted the challenge. So they're going to fight each other at some point. But the two mystery luchadors came out and Drake and Iho prepared to fight together. But then Iho revealed his true colors and ganged up on Drake with the two luchadors. But then the luchadors revealed themselves to be Raul Mendoza and Joaquin Wilde. And 
Then Hijo revealed himself to be Santos Escobar, which I thought was interesting because I had never heard of him. But I was just like, bro, like the reveal was just really cool because here lately you had these mystery luchadors, you know, attacking people outside in the parking lot, you know, trying to drag them in a car, you know, with people who didn't want to go. So now we know that Santos Escobar was behind it all. So Wilder Mendoza gave a double splash to Drake and it was just really interesting. And then Roderick Strong continued to spin out after he got an artsy picture from Dexter. And then he just got the heck out of Dodge, which led to the match with Adam Cole and Dexter Loomis. Dexter is like always giving all kinds of serial killer vibes. So it was just pretty interesting. Strong and Bobby Fish came out and and, um, cheered on the NXT champion who wasn't sure how to handle Loomis' resilience and Cole personality. And then Cole basically got caught with the kata with a kata gatame but then bounced out and then hit a super kick for a near fall and then nxc set up a panama sunrise only for dexter to reverse into the kata gatame but then bobby fish distracted the referee while strong hit an enziguri because of course they always got to cheat and then adam cole got the last shot for the win but then the undisputed era beat down dexter loomis until velveteen dream came out and made the save and the lights went out and then Adam Cole was left in the ring and then Scarlett walked down the ramp with an hourglass in the ring for the NXT champion, which sets up a possible feud between Karrion Cross and Adam Cole. So stuff is getting real cryptic and real interesting on NXT. So now we're going to go to SmackDown. Alright, so now, last but not least, we're going to talk about SmackDown. SmackDown. It was lit yesterday. (laughs) So, there was... So, to talk about the women first. Um, the the women's tag team champions, Sasha Banks and Bayley, came out to celebrate their win with a party and balloons and stuff and if y'all watched it Sasha Banks's outfit stole the show yet again like her clothes are absolutely amazing she came out in this kind of nude looking you know two-piece suit with these pants on and this you know crop top and some high heels that matched and they were just so sparkly and everything and I'm just like and everything was just fitted and I'm just like girl slay constant slay constant slay and then they got booed so but you know um bailey was saying we well no sasha said we told you so we told you we were gonna win but you didn't want to listen we are the leaders and the role models together we are unstoppable bailey wrote a poem for sasha but then she got interrupted by alexa and nikki and basically said you know we don't have a problem with you having a party but she basically saying you know where we draw the line is with poetry though and Nikki talked about how her and Alexa are best friends, even though we do like to party, but, you know, we like to crash them and stuff. But then um, the Iconics interrupted them on the big screen and said that this Sunday they will win their they will get their just due victories. Um, Well, they said that they were going to win due to their victories over both of those tag teams in the past. And then as they insinuated um that they would win cross and bliss attacked sasha and bailey from behind and knocked them out of the ring so honestly that was the most we saw of the women along with mandy rose though because mandy rose was in two segments with otis um as otis and tucker were preparing for their tag team match um for their six-man tag team match with braun Strowman against dolph ziggler and the miz and morrison um he became motive otis became motivated by mandy's kisses and then there was another segment um towards the end of the show where she was in a segment with king corbin because king corbin tried to confront her about how she wanted otis to put on his crown last week and she said no we were just having fun or whatever but then um King Corbin was all like, the only reason why you were doing that is because you actually fantasize about being with a king like me. But then Otis literally left the match (laughs) and beat up on King Corbin and the camera went blank. But then Otis wound up coming back to the match and then Mandy was watching at ringside. So that was really all we saw of the women um, on SmackDown last night. But the beginning of the show started with 
a recap of Jeff Hardy's address to the people last week and Seamus's response and attack. And then the trainee was the trainees were dancing to the theme song. Are you ready? You know, whatever. And then Renee Young came out to mediate Jeff Hardy and Seamus's contract sh- signing. Seamus came out with a doctor, two security dudes and a mystery podium of sorts. And then Jeff, of course, came by himself. And Seamus wanted assurances. Um, and he basically said that he couldn't trust Jeff because of his, of course, alcoholic past. And before he signed the contract, he said that Jeff Hardy had to take a urine test, which is so, you know, demoralizing. But he and then Seamus said he refused to fight Jeff, you know, if he fails and he calls him a junkie. And then Jeff said, my name is Jeff Hardy and I'm an alcoholic. Hello, Jeff, my brother. And then he said, I go to meetings and talk about how I let myself down, my family down, and my fans down. And then he stated that he was going to be a beacon of light for people who are dealing with this every day. And then he'll take the, and he'll pay it, pass the test in order to fight him on Sunday. And then Seamus said that Dr. Kirshenbell was going to give him a rapid test. And then he basically gave a PSA as Jeff Hardy was, you know, peeing in the jar. And said, you know, if you're a user, you're a loser. But then Seamus continued to rip Matt Hardy as the test is taking place. But then Jeff used some inspiration that, um, from, I guess, Shawn Michaels when he said, sometimes it's better to get, and forgive me for saying this, pissed off than pissed on. And he threw the pee on him. And I laughed, like, harder than I probably should have at that. But then the NXT trainees were chanting, you got pissed on. You got pissed on. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, <laughs> and then it showed backstage where Seamus was washing himself and his mouth out and stuff. And then, do- and then the doctor came and told Seamus that Jeff's test actually came back negative. So now Sunday we have the match and it's still going forward. And Seamus was mad. And then the New Day was coming out to fight Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. And this was where I lost focus on the match. And I know that Shinsuke and Cesaro wound up winning the match of course and the match was good but I would be remiss if I did not mention that Kofi Kingston and Biggie came out and did a Black Lives Matter salute by taking a knee and holding up their um, right fist in the air to applause and they were doing it to pay tribute to the lives of three black women in particular whose lives were taken by um, either enforcement or by people who just took it upon themselves to just hurt them and they paid tribute to Breonna Taylor um who's been in the news here lately due to the Black Lives Matter movement Tamala Horsford who lost her life um in a very tragic manner and I suggest you look that up because I won't discuss it here and Shukri Abdi and they took pictures and put it on Twitter and I was absolutely grateful for it um it made me very emotional so hence why i can't really give you a play-by-play on the match because i was just very emotional about it so all i know is that shinsuke beat kofi by a roll-up so i'm sorry i can't give a play-by-play on that match but the most important part of that match was that display by kofi and biggie acknowledging their blackness on national television and on fox no less and that just meant a lot to me Um, as a black woman to see them pay tribute, you know, to those women and yeah. So, and also I would like to say that I tweeted and tagged Kofi and Big E and said, thank you for that pose. And Big E actually liked it. So it was a good night. Anyway, then Corey Graves gave a narration of the history of the intercontinental title to lead up to the finals of the Intercontinental title tournament with AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan. He basically mentioned how the likes of Ricky Steamboat, um, Randy Savage, The Rock, The British Bulldog, China, The Miz, Rick Rude, Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair, Honky Talk Man, and the like have all won the match and discussed the similarities and the differences between Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles and their means of moving forward in the tournament and their work um, philosophies all around. Because, of course, Daniel Bryan fought his way into the finals. And then AJ took the bye, which was, I guess, a smart move. Um, But then Corey asked the question, who will revel in the glory and join the lineage of legends? And, oh, did we find out. AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan fought. 
and then they and then they basically mentioned how Michael Cole mentioned how the inaugural Intercontinental Champion, <clears throat> excuse me, was Pat Patterson in 1979. And let me tell you, this match was a classic clinic. Like, in the modern terms, sometimes in the modern era, it's kind of hard to look to find clinics because on television, they sort of try to do a 50-50 between the entertainment side and the wrestling side. But this match kind of leaned more towards the wrestling side more than anything. And the moments where you can find matches like that, you've got to cherish it. And this was one of those moments. And it was really good. It was such a barn burner of a match. Like in the early going of the match, you had um, both of them catch each other's arm locks and sort of counter them. And then AJ looked surprised at Daniel's quickness. Daniel Bryan was working on AJ's lower back and left arm. And then Styles was battling back, battle back with a drop kick. And then AJ reversed arm holds onto Daniel. But then Daniel kept giving a knee, gave a knee trip up and then prepared to surfboard submission. But instead used an inverted leg lock on AJ. And Daniel Bryan just gives all kinds of stellar submissions throughout this match. It was amazing. And there was major near fall action. And then... Daniel viciously manipulated Styles' arm further, and then Daniel missed the running kick in the corner as Styles moved out of the way. And then AJ kicked Brian's leg as it hung on the rope. And then Daniel countered AJ's phenomenal forearm setup and then gave all kinds of yes kicks. And then he used the right leg for yes kicks, but then AJ kicked and punched his way back into the match. And then Daniel flipped AJ into an arm bar, <laughs> but then AJ reversed into the calf crutcher. And then after reversing each other's moves back and forth, Daniel came to a near fall after a kick. But then AJ Styles won the title with the phenomenal forearm. And I know I didn't, it was impossible to get every piece of playback in this match simply because it ran from almost, from basically the end of the seven o'clock hour, if you live here in Alabama, into the middle of the eight o'clock hour. And it was amazing. So I would suggest you go back and watch it if you have a chance. But AJ Styles came out as the victor, and this is his first Intercontinental title. And then Renee Young came and congratulated him and interviewed him afterward. And he said, I'm the best WWE champion the fans have ever seen. And he stated that he was phenomenal. Straight fire. Anyway. <laughs> no Becky Lynch though. I miss her. Anyway, then they did a recap of the Miz and Morrison um doing their van pranking shenanigans last week with Braun Strowman and Kayla. And they did an interview um with Kayla who looked visibly irritated at them because they basically caused the slime to fall on her and not on Braun Strowman. And so they basically talked about how they were gonna um make Braun Strowman's life a living heck and then they tried to premiere a music video but it got interrupted by Braun Strowman's entrance into their match or whatever and then Braun vowed before his match that Miz and Morrison you know that he was going to damage them beyond repair but he's definitely wasn't in the mood for Otis and his attempted cash in shenanigans so <laughs> Um, then they showed a vignette of Matt Riddle who's going to be making his Smackdown debut pretty soon and then um, Braun Strowman and his match, um, his tag match with Heavy Machinery versus Dolph Ziggler and Miz and Morrison took place. And Miz got tossed by Otis multiple times. Then after dominating the match, King Corbin, of course, interrupted, like I mentioned earlier, with Mandy in the segment or whatever. And how Otis came and beat him up. And then he came back to the ring to fight. And so Tucker and Braun were on their own until Otis came back. And then Otis battled back and then danced, and then danced as Ziggler was thrown over the top rope. And then Braun goes on the freight train move where he runs around the ring and tackles people, you know, over and over again. And then Otis did the caterpillar on Dolph to get further revenge for how he made his life a living heck. And they won. And then, of course, Mandy was watching the match. And so she came in after they won and stuff. And so Heavy Machinery and Braun were celebrating. But something that I found really interesting was the fact that Mandy kept eyeing the universal title as if she wanted to win it. And I'm just like, Mandy, do you want those problems? But I'm pretty sure he, she was eyeing the title on Otis's behalf. Because, of course, you know, since Otis has the money in the bank contract, he can cash in at any time at any point between now and next year. So there's that. And SmackDown was just pretty solid um, last night. So that's the end of this week in wrestling.
All right, we've reached the conclusion of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening to my 15th episode. And I just realized it's my 15th episode. So woo! thank you um, for those who've been listening from the beginning. And for those who have just started, thank you so much for listening. And know that you can follow me on all social media pa- platforms. You can follow me on Twitter at um, Hardy Wrestle Pod. And follow me on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast. And if you have any questions, you can always, you know, DM me there. And you should also follow me on Facebook at Hardy Wrestling Podcast as well. Also, I want to give a huge thank you and a great, amazing shout out and all kinds of love and blessings to JT Funk for coming on my show. If you have a mind to, please watch his matches on YouTube. He is really great. And also, if you have a mind to, please, if you want more masks and stuff to sort of protect you from the crisis, he's selling JT Funk masks for $15. Please, you know, if you want to message him, you know, follow or follow him, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at the JT Funk and DM him about those masks, you know, if you want to support him and stuff. He's also selling t-shirts on Teespring. And, you know, if you want to message him about those shirts, please do so as well. So thank you so much for listening to my show. You can listen to it everywhere you get your podcasts on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, you know, look it up wherever you can. So until we meet again, thank you so much for listening to my show. And just remember, be loved, be blessed, and but most importantly, be yourself. This was Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy. Bye, y'all.